Design is a challenging, complex, wonderful, and delicious profession. Every day, the designer is presented with problems he must solve visually. And contrary to what many may think, design is not just about creating logos, flyers, or art. It's much more. But what is design? According to Brazilian designer Alexandre Vohner, design is a project. It's simple but too vague. Let's try a less broad definition. According to Paul Rolf and Yanir Wan and their paper entitled A Proposal for Formal Definition of the Design Concept, design is a specification of an object manifested by an agent intended to accomplish goals in a particular environment using a set of primitive components satisfying a set of requirements subject to constraints. I know it seems complex to understand, so I offer a simple explanation. Design is a way to communicate an idea or concept using design processes, elements, and principles. Of course, this brings more questions. What is a design process, elements, or principle? Let's take it easy, because by the end of this class, it should be easier to understand. What isn't design? It's funny how this question seems slightly easier to answer. Many people start learning design with preconceived ideas of what designers do, and end up being disappointed when they realize how much theory there is behind design. So let's make it clear what design is not. Design is not about knowing how to use software such as Photoshop, Illustrator, Blender, GIMP, or Windows Paint. To learn design, you don't have to draw like Leonardo da Vinci, paint like Rembrandt, or sculpt like Michelangelo. Designers don't necessarily spend ridiculous amounts of hours in front of a computer, and ideally, he'll only use the computer for the final stages of his work. Believe me when I say there are many designers that don't use a computer at all, except to scan and reproduce work they've created. If you create a logo for some company without going through a process beforehand, it means you haven't done design. Design must have a meaning, and it must communicate something. Cake design and hair design aren't designed in the real sense of the word, because it isn't communicating anything. There is no project, there is no reason. Design must communicate a message. If it doesn't, it's art. Which brings us to the next question. Is design art? The most straightforward answer is no, but allow me to expand on the subject. Art must be interpreted, design should not be. But what does this mean? When you see a painting, it will provoke an emotion, a feeling, or an image. A painting that gives me the sense of anxiety may give you an impression of bliss. Every person interprets art as they see fit, but design has to be interpreted by the same way by everyone. It doesn't mean design can't be art. Of course it can. There are many design projects that have their own space in museums, because they are indeed true masterpieces. But above all, they have a function that is understood and not interpreted. Art is beauty and design is aesthetics, and further on I'll explain the difference between them both. What's the difference between design, graphic design, product design, web design, and so on? Well, design has several branches. The most popular ones are graphic design, product design, and web design. There's also fashion design, interface design, game design, motion design, and so on. In simple terms, a graphic designer will create printed graphics, such as logos, posters, flyers, folders, etc. A product designer will create physical elements, such as chairs, tables, electronics, and so on. And web designers work with digital design, creating websites, online banners, and anything related to online image. What does a designer do? A designer will take a problem and arrive at a visual solution through a project. A simple example. A company wants to change their perceived image as it's currently focused on a 30 plus year old audience. And they want to tackle a younger audience, let's say 16 to 29 years old. The designer will be in charge of changing the way the company communicates with their audience, updating their brand to reflect its new position. The designer will devise, set up, create the concept, develop, elaborate, and specify the solution for a problem. He will take a problem, research why it exists, work on alternatives to solve it, create prototypes, develop these ideas, test it with a sample of the target audience, and finalize it for delivery. The designer has to have a thirst for knowledge. He has to know how to study and hunt for information. Design is a multidisciplinary profession. Many times you'll have to become your client or become his target audience to be able to see the problem through another angle. Besides, it is vital to be always updated and even though the basics of design never change, there are always new developments emerging in the market and you need to stay on top of them. Must the designer know how to draw? As I mentioned before, you don't have to draw like a modern day Leonardo da Vinci, but it's necessary to be able to transmit a concept using a pen and paper. My drawing is far from perfect, but it's decent enough to be able to sketch ideas in my mind. I won't focus on teaching how to draw, as there are many websites out there that cover the basics. Another way of getting used to the act of sketching with confidence is to practice it constantly. 
Always walk around with a notebook or sketch pad and a pencil. And whenever you have some spare time, draw. Draw anything. Items on your desks, uh, ideas, existing logos, anything goes. Besides, being able to sketch out ideas really makes the creation process easier. Drawing a new alternative for a logo is much faster on paper than it is on a computer, for example. So what is design? With everything we've learned here, it makes it easier to understand what is design. Design is the communication of a message using form, lines, colors, and textures. This message must solve a problem, and for that the designer must create a project. And what is this project? I'll explain that in the following classes. Let's have an example of what a designer can do. How can a designer help a restaurant chain? He can project the logo or visual identity of the restaurant, take care of the visual communication of the menu, he can do the interior design so the user experience is consistent in all of the restaurants, and so on. Design may be a complex profession, but it's not too hard to understand what it is. As we saw in the last section, if there isn't a process, there isn't design. A logo that hasn't passed through a project is a drawing, not a logo. If there isn't a reason or motive behind what you are creating, it's art. But what are the benefits of following a design process? It gives your design value. When you establish a design process that clearly defines objectives, you and your clients can assess the success of the project with a good degree of precision. Besides, this information is great to land new jobs in the future, as it demonstrates the importance and influence of your design process within the success of the company. At the end of the project, you can analyze the results and discover what can be done to improve future results, something hard to do if you don't follow a process. It helps present your work. By establishing and enabling to explain your process, you gain valuable tools necessary for more organized presentation of your work. Just by having a process, you are automatically enabled to justify the reasons behind your choices in the final project. As clients usually don't have any idea what designers have to go through or the level of difficulty involved, Having a process gives context to your choices and explains how these choices reach the final objective. A classic example is when a client is presented with a logo and asks for a change in color. Most of the times, this decision is based merely on personal taste. When the designer has a clear objective and a well-defined process to reach it, the color will naturally be chosen based on these, and the change requested by a client can deviate your design from its final objective. By understanding your motivation and process, you will be less likely to ask for these superfluous changes. It keeps you organized and productive. How many times have you sat in front of a blank screen without the faintest clue on how to start a design? By having a design process, as long as it doesn't limit you too much, it will give you a starting point. Your design process should help you establish a context into where the design will be inserted. And although this may be what puts some designers off, it will also be the elements to define the success of your design. It establishes credibility and creates value. You see this every day, but you haven't noticed it. And this is how great design companies justify their expensive price tags. The process and implicit results are what attract their clients. And with time and fine tuning, soon enough it is also what will put you ahead of your other fellow designers. Design processes. There's substantial amount of disagreement between designers on how to produce design. Some authors argue that there are many ways of describing design processes and discuss two basic and fundamentally different ways, both of which have several names. The prevailing view has been called the rational model, or the reason-centric perspective. The alternative view has been called the action-centric model, or action-centric perspective. The rational model. The rational model is what many universities and courses focus on, as the methodology is more solid and comprehensible. Developed by Herbert A. Simon and expanded by Paul and Brights in their book Engineering Design Systematic Approach, this model posits that 1. Designers attempt to optimize the design candidate for known constraints and objectives. 2. The design process is plan-driven. 3. The design process is understood in terms of discrete sequence of stages. This model is based on a rationalist philosophy, according to which design is informed by research and knowledge in a predictable and controlled manner. Technical rationality is at the center of this process. Let's see an example of the stages in the rational model. Design pre-production includes a briefing, information analysis, research, problem specification, problem solution, and presenting design solutions. Design during production includes the development of the solution and field tests. Post-production, solution implementation, evaluation, and completion. Redesign that can be done before, during, or after production. As this is just an introductory course, I won't expand too much on how the rational process works and I'll leave it for a future, more in-depth course. The action-centric model. It is pretty much the opposite of the rational model. 
It posits that 1. Designers use creativity and emotion to generate design candidates. 2. The design process is improvised. 3. No universal sequence of stages is apparent. Analysis, design and implementation are contemporary and inextricably linked. This model is based on empiricist philosophy and amethodical development. Just like the rational model, the process relies on research and knowledge, but in this case, knowledge and research are brought to the process to the designer's better judgment and good sense. The designer's experience and professional judgment are more important than rational technicality. For being less intuitive than a rational model and rely heavily on professional experience, this process should be avoided by students and novice designers. Design Elements In graphic design, there are several key visual elements that will enable you to communicate your message clearly. There are some disagreements regarding the exact number of basic visual elements in design that can reach from 4 to 10. But the exact number doesn't matter. What does matter is that all authors agree on the main conceptual elements, which we will review in this class. They are line, form, color, texture, mass, and space. Although I'll cover the basic of these elements in this course, in a future course here on Udemy, I'll expand on them better. Let's get to it. Line. The line can be short, long, straight, curvy, solid, dashed, thick, or thin. It can be horizontal, vertical, diagonal, or even invade the third dimension. Lines can be used to divide different sections on the design, or as it creates a sense of movement, it directs the user to look in a specific direction. And depending on the line style, this movement can be simple or more complex. A line with several curves will direct the user's eye around. A dashed line can create small pauses in the way we follow it. Form is the second most used element in design. Any form is nothing more than several lines combined in different directions and with specific sizes that create a new element. These can be circles, squares, rectangles, or any abstract objects. Minimalist design quite often uses simple form, such as circles and squares in their design. And a form doesn't have to be obvious. A block of justified text can easily be seen as a rectangle. Just like lines, forms can also be associated in our mind with different senses. Circles are associated with nature and movement while squares and triangles can be seen as a more basic structurally sound design. Color Color is one of the most important elements in design and can be found everywhere. Even white and black can be considered color. It can be subtle or flashy, can invoke anger, serenity, and even hunger. The amazing thing about color is that you don't have to consciously realize what emotion the color is evoking, but your brain subconsciously does. Studies show that people living in a mostly red environment suffer from higher blood pressure and faster heartbeats than people living in mostly blue environments. This can lead us to conclude that color is indeed vital for the success of a great design. Color can also create contrast, draw attention, give a feeling of depth, emphasize and change the way we relate to an object. Color theory is a large subject in design, one that we will review better in a future course. Texture don't be fooled, texture isn't only for print. The term refers to the characteristics of a surface that can be tactile as well as visual. Textures can be related with the context in which it is inserted, complementing or strengthening a message. Textures with big elements are usually more aggressive, while textures with a finer grain tend to be more delicate. In most cases, texture acts as a secondary agent, giving support to the main image and reinforcing the visual concept of the design. If badly used, Texture can confuse our eyes by adding unnecessary noise to the composition. Mass Mass is a physical or visually observable size. Size can be relative. A golf ball can be small compared to a golf course, but enormous compared to an atom, and that changes our perception and design. An outdoor ad can seem much larger if text and pictures are used sparingly, the same way a business card can appear to be heavier if it has too many visual details. This is mass in action. Long text with good line height spacing can be easier to read as it will seem to have light mass, and a phrase written with big, thick letters can draw a bigger impact as it will seem heavier, and it will also be more noticeable than lighter elements. Space Recently, white space has played an important paper in modern design, and it gives out a lighter feeling and helps direct your eyes to the more important elements. Let's take Google's homepage as an example. 
There's a lot of white space and our eyes easily get fixated on what really is important on the page, the search function. Besides, space is also important in minimalism as it praises the less is more idea. The lack of white space, or just space, can also give out the aspect of being unorganized or excessive weights in a visual project, creating confusion and losing the main message. White space doesn't necessarily have to be white colored, but a space without any visual elements that will grab and hold our attention. Principles of Design Design has certain principles it uses to communicate a message, besides words and images. How we use these principles in our design will affect the structure and readability of the message we are trying to communicate. All these design principles can be applied to any project, and how they are used will determine the efficiency of the design and how attractive it is. There is no one right way to apply any of these principles. In this course we will only graze the surface of what these principles are and what they do. Alignment Alignment brings order to chaos, helps organize similar items, creates groups and visual connections. Good alignment should go by unnoticed by the viewer, as bad alignment, intentional or not, will be very noticeable. The lack of alignment creates a sloppy and unorganized design, as does the mixing of too many different types of alignment. But I must point out that it's not wrong to break alignment in order to create tension or to put a specific element in the spotlight. Balance It is important to balance the occasional chocolate with a healthy meal, and balance in design is equally important. In most cases, we feel more comfortable with balanced layouts where graphics don't overpower the text and the page doesn't seem like it's leaning to one side. As we learned in the past class, all elements have a mass and it is the designer's job to know how to balance the elements on a page. Contrast Have you ever noticed that in the professional basketball game, all players seem to be about the same size? But if you stand a regular sized person next to one of these players, you'll notice that they are much taller on average than most of us. This is contrast. In design, big and small elements, black text on white foreground, squares and circles can create contrast. Contrast occurs when two or more elements are different from one another, and the bigger the difference, the bigger the contrast. The most important tip is to make this contrast obvious. Only a slight contrast that is still noticeable can seem like a mistake by the designer. We use contrast and design to emphasize what is most important or to direct the user's eye. But beware, it is possible to overdo contrast. Too much use of contrast will overwhelm the user with emphasized elements. Proximity When an observer sees several elements on a page, his brain will automatically try and associate a connection between them. The designer can use this in his advantage, arranging objects and groups to help him create a meaning, better disseminating the message. This is called proximity. Proximity creates a link between elements on a page. Objects near each other suggest some type of relationship, and the further apart they are, the more it suggests difference. A good example of this we can find in a text. Phrases in the same paragraph mean they follow the same line of thought, and a change in paragraph symbolizes the changing of the subject. Repetition Also called consistency, this principle helps maintain order throughout a project. Note how in most of these presentations, there is always a main title at the beginning of a subject, the same title again, shown above the screen in a light grey color, and the text is always the same color, height and length on all videos. This is repetition. You can also see in magazines, note how the layout repeats itself, following a certain pattern. Some pages have the same number of columns, the position of the pictures may also be the same, and certain elements are always present, like where the page numbers are shown. Repeating graphic elements helps maintain a consistent experience in your design. Design elements in the real world Now that we have learned what are the design elements, we can use this knowledge to identify their usage in the real world. I'll leave the following exercise. Grab a few magazines or even your junk mail and look for these elements. I recommend magazines instead of newspapers as they usually contain more ads and these tend to be created by graphic design agencies. You can also look at websites to try and identify elements. Just open a website you usually access and see what you can find. Look at an ad. Can you see lines in them? What are these lines used for? To separate information or to direct your eyes? What about forms? What forms do you see in the ad? Why are they there? The colors that I use seem more serene or aggressive? Does the contrast make something important pop out from the rest of the content? Is there any texture? What is it simulating? Why? 
Does the position of the elements generate mass, making the design lighter or heavier? And finally, space. Is there enough white space or is the information crammed up? If possible, circle these elements and make annotations. When you're out and about, keep an eye out for anything graphic related. Stop and take a long look. What are the details you see? You might note that not all designs will have all elements, and the ones of inferior quality might have none of these. Design principles in the real world. In this exercise, we will keep an eye out for design principles, alignment, balance, contrast, proximity, and repetition. As in the last exercise, try and grab a hold of a magazine, newspaper, junk mail, or just open up a few of your usual websites. See if you can find these principles applied to what you're looking at. Another good exercise is to imagine how that image can be made better by better applying the principles. You can even try and imagine how you can make it worse by intentionally screwing up the principles. Understanding how to break something is also important. Get special attention to graphic projects you feel aren't quite right. Why do they seem odd? Is it because some principles are not being applied correctly? Ignoring the actual wording of a design project can also help you understand what makes it different from the rest. Course Revision As we approach the ending of Introduction to Design course, let's just quickly review some of the things we learned. Design can be explained to be a way to communicate an idea or concept using design processes, elements, and principles. A designer will be presented with a problem he must solve visually, and he must do so following a design process. If there isn't a visual solution, there isn't design. There are several types of design processes, the most notable ones being the rational model and action-centric model. The rational model is ideal for beginner designers, as the process is better documented. The six basic elements in design are line, form, color, texture, mass, and space. There are five basic principles of design. Alignment, balance, contrast, proximity, and repetition. I hope that this course has made it easier to understand more about what truly is design. Once again, I must disclose that I've only scratched the surface of the design basics, and I will tackle them in a more in-depth course in the future. I would very much appreciate that if you enjoy this course and it has been useful for you, you could rate it on Udemy. Please don't hesitate to leave any questions you might have using the Udemy interface. Your question might be also relevant to other users. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again soon.